Hello, welcome back to New Scientist Weekly, your curated selection of the week's science stories. I'm Christy Taylor in New York. And I'm Tim Revel, also in New York. Welcome to the show. It's episode 206, and as usual, we will be joined by our fantastic international team of journalists bringing us the most fascinating headlines of the week. We'll be talking about how nature beat us to a Nobel Prize-winning finding by billions of years, two newly discovered species of saber-toothed cat, home improvements with the help of fungi, and a star that has two faces. Yes, it is as odd as it sounds, and I am not just talking about Tim's pronunciation of fungi. But first, medical reporter Claire Wilson is here. Hello. Hi there. And Claire, you've been delving into research that may offer some of the first data that could help us quantify or measure consciousness in humans or others. Please explain. Yes. Well, this is a new approach that attempts to measure the level of consciousness in people using brain scans with help from one of the leading ideas in consciousness science. Um, So this has been around for about 20 years When I try to even think about my own consciousness, Claire, I start to feel a bit like that infinity effect you get when you look in like two mirrors that are facing each other. It's this kind of never ending loop of trying to understand my brain with my brain. Why is this so difficult for us to wrap our heads around? I I thought we had these great big brains exactly for problems like this. Well, fair enough. I mean, the human brain is, uh, after all, the most complex object in the known universe. And the question of how a, a three pound lump of flesh can create (laughs) <laughs> sentience. It, it is one of the most mind-boggling mysteries that I can think of. I mean, neuroscientists call it the hard problem, and that's not for nothing. Yeah, that is not for nothing. So have we now uh, cracked it? Well, they've made some progress with this theory. Now, it's called integrated information theory. Um, so far, it's been based more on kind of mathematical theorizing than actually studying the human brain. And it says that an information processing system's level of consciousness is the degree to which it integrates information. And you can quantify that mathematically. Well, it's no secret that I like a bit of mathematical theorizing. (laughs) And I'm also fascinated by consciousness. So how does one inform the other? Well, basically, you're judging consciousness based on the degree to which the interactions between a thing's components yield more information than if those components were considered individually. And in theory, you can calculate a value for this, uh, which they call phi, the Greek letter. So I want to make sure I have this right. According to integrated information theory, phi is this number that would represent how conscious something is. And maybe humans have a lot of phi, and a cat has less phi, and and maybe a banana has even less phi. So (laughs) how do you actually measure phi in the lab? Well, that's the catch, because the calculations that let you do this are incredibly dense. And at the moment, they can only be done for a network that has a handful of connection points or nodes, and where you have complete knowledge of how it operates. And if you consider that the human brain has 86 billion neurons, and our knowledge of how it works is very incomplete, you can imagine we're a very long way from being able to test out this idea on our own minds. So we can't really test this out on our own minds. How do we know if this theory is correct? Okay, so in the new study, instead of treating each neuron in the brain as a single node in the network, the scientists used a simplified model of the brain using data from brain scanning techniques. They treated small anatomical brain areas as if each one was a node within an information processing network to calculate an approximation for the value of phi within that specific network of the brain. So I see the idea is that that makes the calculations much simpler, although I I imagine they're probably still quite hard. What's what's the result? Does the math say we are in fact conscious? (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's not like the point of these calculations is to spit out a single number for phi and that that would tell us anything about consciousness. But what was interesting is that they did all this brain scanning and calculating as people were in different levels of anesthesia, uh, you know, like you would get if you had an operation in hospital. And they did find that for two key brain networks, the level of phi was just as you'd expect high when people were awake slightly lower when they entered mild sedation, and then lower still as the anaesthetic took fully hold and they were, they were deeply sedated. 
Yeah, that, that seems to make sense. I mean, it certainly matches how conscious I would feel in any of those states. Yes. And the doctors involved say they may be able to use the same calculations to calculate phi for people who have had uh, very severe brain injuries and they they emerge from a coma into a vegetative state. And when that happens, doctors can find it hard to know just how conscious people really are and whether they might recover. I see. So this use of integrated information theory could actually move beyond being highly theoretical into, into something medical practitioners, for example, might actually be able to use. Exactly. That's really cool. But how does this get back to that so-called hard problem of neuroscience? You know, is developing this metric going to help us get to a better understanding of what consciousness is or how it arises? I mean, I feel weird even just thinking of myself as an information processing system. Yeah, I I knew you were going to ask me that. So I'm afraid it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so in fact, it's hard to imagine how any kind of result from studying people as they lie in a brain scanner or or doing mathematical calculations about their brain activity would ever be able to explain the mystery of it, how the workings of organic matter conjures up those, you know, the ineffable sensations of sentience, the feeling of, of happiness or the taste of a ripe peach or, or even just the visual experience of seeing the color red. So that is the essence of the hard problem. And you can argue we can't really imagine how that could be explained at the moment. However, you could argue that this latest work is a first step in that if integrated information theory is found to be along the right lines, well, that might take us somewhere closer to getting there, to, to understanding consciousness at least a bit more than we currently do in the future, one day. One day. Well, thank you so much, Claire, for helping us inch closer in our understanding. Our next story is a pretty incredible discovery about graphene, which was first knowingly created by humans in 2004. And as a quick reminder, graphene is a layer of carbon just a single atom thick. It's stronger than diamonds and conducts electricity better than many metals, and so it has been touted for everything from faster electronics to better biomedical devices. It also won the discoverer a Nobel Prize. And so much has been written about graphene since its discovery that the only way you could have really avoided it would be if you had been living under a rock. But now it turns out that living under a rock might not have even been enough to save you from graphene, as it could <laughs> naturally occur there, which is quite the discovery. So here with all the details is our reporter, Alex Wilkins. Hi, Alex. Hi. Now, Alex, am I correct in thinking that nature beat us to the discovery of graphene by literally billions of years. Yeah, you would be correct in thinking that. Um, it's a pretty remarkable finding. I was actually at a talk last week at the Goldschmidt Conference, which is the largest geochemistry conference in the world. And a group of researchers from Japan announced that they had found graphene while looking at 3.2 billion year old rock deposits underneath a South African gold mine. That sounds like a really unexpected finding. I mean, what was it doing there? Presumably it wasn't just, you know, floating freely in like a big graphene puddle, I guess. No, it wasn't as simple as that, unfortunately. Um, it was in these rock deposits, uh, which contain all sorts of different uh, compounds. And Yoko Otomo, one of the researchers, was analysing these rock deposits to see what was in them, whether, whether she could sort of infer details about the history of the region. Um, and she used a high-resolution microscope to look at these structures. And she found all these sort of strange carbon uh, structures and compounds like thin carbon filaments and flakes of just a few micrometers across. And then she also saw these crystal nanoparticles that were wrapped in a really thin layer of graphene, just a few layers thick. This sounds to me like, you know, if you were going deep sea fishing, like in the middle of the ocean, and suddenly you hooked a cell phone or something, it just sounds super out of place. How do we think this graphene formed in the first place? Yeah, so the complete story isn't there yet, but we think we have a theory and, of course, it's ancient planktonic bacteria. What else? <laughs> what else? So Atomo analyzed the carbon atoms that were in the graphene and found isotopes, which are these atoms that differ by the amount of neutrons in it, and found these isotopes that were only really come from biological matter. Um, Atomo thinks the carbon probably came from bacteria near the ocean surface at the time that died, fell to the seafloor, and were then molded and reacted by high pressures and temperatures in the Earth's crust. That's very cool. Some bacteria billions of years old making one of the most advanced materials we know of. 
Very cool indeed. So is the bacteria's graphene exactly the same as the graphene we make in the lab, or is there some sort of difference? Yeah, so as is often the case with sort of ancient geology, that there are all sorts of um, quirks here. And one quirk is that the graphene doesn't seem to be exactly the same as that really pristine lab-produced graphene that we know of. One strange feature is it appears to be transparent, whereas in the lab it's normally black when we look at it under a microscope. And this sort of suggests there might be some other elements or compounds hiding in its structure that, that means it's not perfectly pure graphene. That's super weird and, again, very cool. I don't know how many times we can keep saying <laughs> that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it one more time. Does it affect us? Does it matter that nature did this first? You know, are we going to go mining for graphene or can we learn from these bacteria for our own purposes somehow? Yeah, so mining might be jumping the gun a little bit, but this can definitely help us in, in all sorts of ways when it comes to graphene. Um, I think the big picture here is that it can help us make better graphene and, and more easily and, and use less energy. So there are lots of industrial methods for making graphene, but they all have their shortcomings and problems. And one problem with a lot of them is that they require really high temperatures, this method called chemical vapor deposition. And it requires temperatures above 1,000 degrees C, which is about 2,000 Fahrenheit. Um, and as you can imagine, that requires loads of energy. But the graphene that Otomo found in these uh, deposits under the gold mine, she thinks that the temperatures there were more like 250 to 300 degrees C, or like 400, 570 Fahrenheit. And if we can understand exactly what the processes were here and how the bacteria produced it and, and what the sort of pressures and temperatures were, then we might be able to use the techniques here to make more efficient graphene in the lab and, and in factories and save huge amounts of energy. It just astounds me that what was probably the biggest material science breakthrough in decades had just been sitting there in a naturally occurring form for billions of years waiting to be discovered. Absolutely amazing. I wonder what else is out there. I know, yeah, it's really got me thinking, and, and I agree, it's it's incredible. I mean, just to sum it up, bacteria that died billions of years ago and fell to the seafloor happened to react in just the right way under high pressure and heat to make one of the most advanced and promising materials that we know of and that we couldn't even produce ourselves until about 20 years ago. Thank you so much, Alex. Thanks very much. It's time for a quick break to tell you about other exciting things in your new Scientist podcast feed. This week, we kicked off the Dead Planet Society series, a 10-episode exploration of how to break our solar system. For fun, of <laughs> course, just theoretical. If you ever wanted to put out the sun, well, that was episode one, which is available now on the main New Scientist podcast feed. And in just a couple of weeks, the Dead Planet Society team will be punching a hole in a planet. Don't try this at home. You probably don't have the tools. <laughs> and if that's not enough destruction for you, I've interviewed Kai Bird, the biographer of J. Robert Oppenheimer. He's the man credited with successfully leading the U.S. race to finish the atomic bomb during World War II. Yes, the guy from the movie. We take a look at the controversies, costs, and still reverberating consequences of that race, as well as the interior life of the man himself. I sympathize with the dilemma he faced. You know, you can't turn away from science, you can't turn away from trying to explore the physical world. And yet, unfortunately, one of the, the results of this is the invention of these weapons of mass destruction. And, uh, you know, we're still trying to live with this, live with the bomb. And I think it's important for us to understand that the father of the atomic bomb you know, three months after Hiroshima was trying to warn us that these are weapons of terror, they're not weapons of defense, they're weapons for aggressors. And uh, that's how we should think about them. Christie's fantastic piece on that will be out on Tuesday. And finally, if you weren't sure how to spend 2024, why not consider a trip to the poles? Yes, New Scientist is launching not one, but two cruises to our planet's icy extremes. In March 2024, join expert guides in following the footsteps of Ernest Shackleton to Antarctica. It's peak time for whale sightings, curious young penguins, and some of the clearest waters on Earth. Or, if your heart yearns for northerly seas, join us in June of 2024 in the Arctic. We'll visit the glaciers of Svalbard, Norway, along with other Arctic treats. The odds are good of seeing polar bears, beluga whales, and even our long-lost podcast host, New Scientist's very own Rowan Hooper. So that's where he went. More information at newscientist.com slash tours.
We've got a fossil life form of the week up next. Wildlife reporter Corinne Wetzel is here with fossil findings that may reshape our understanding of the evolution of a very famous feline, the saber-toothed cat. Hey, Corinne. Hey. So I'm always here for more cats of whatever kind. What did we find? So am I. So scientists found four species of saber-toothed cat uh, in a collection of fossils near Cape Town, South Africa. So two of these species we already knew about and two are brand new to science. New cats? More cats? What do we know about the newcomers? When did they live? You know, what kind of environments did they live in? And how do we even know this? Right. So there is quite a lot we can learn from their bones. We don't know, you know, what color their fur was, exactly what they looked like, because those things don't preserve too well over millions of years. Um, But we do know a little bit about their lifestyle. Um, So both of these cats lived around 5 million years ago, and they were sort of jaguar-sized. One was a little bit bigger. Think of like uh, not quite as big as a lion, but uh, let's say a beefy jaguar. And one was a bit smaller, <laughs> sort of like... We love a, a beefy jaguar. <laughs> right, who doesn't? And one was smaller, sort of like uh, a small leopard. Um, and they both had those characteristic big fangs that saber-toothed cats have. Um, in their case, they were about 10 centimeters long. And the other two species that we already knew about from this area, one's a little bigger and a little smaller. So these are sort of right in the middle. Do we know anything about what sort of lifestyles they would have had? Yeah, so they actually, each of these uh, scientists think had a little bit different lifestyles. So one of the species they discovered, the sort of big jaguar-sized cat, um, they think was a runner based on sort of its elongated skull shape. So maybe not quite as adapted to running as like a cheetah, but a better runner than, let's say, a lion. Um, And the second one was more of a leopard-type cat. So it likely lived in forests and sort of ambush prey rather than chasing it down. Yeah, I'm mildly allergic to cats, but I think I'd be very allergic to a, a saber toothed cat running at me, <laughs> like with the speed of a cheetah. Oh. I think actually for some people it might come as a bit of a surprise when we say saber toothed cat that we're talking about more than one species, but there are actually many of them in different parts of the world. So what are we starting to understand about how they evolved? Right. So fossils of saber-toothed cats have been found in North America, Europe, South America, Asia, Africa. So these guys were on almost every continent. Um, And we know there's at least dozens of these species. And as part of this work, scientists put together the first family tree of saber-tooths in Africa, which has at least 13 known species now. That's amazing. So is any of these truly a saber-toothed tiger? Because that's the one I've heard of. Right. So saber-toothed tiger is also the term I grew up using. Um, But as of a few years ago, the community really switched to the term saber-toothed cat because these guys are not that closely related to tigers. So (laughs) saber-toothed cats and tigers and lions, they're all felines. So they're all in that mammal family. Um, But when it comes to how closely they're related to each other, they're pretty distant relatives. So modern bobcats and lions are more closely related than um, they are to these saber-toothed cats. So I got to ask, because I think I saw that these these bones have just been sitting in a museum for several decades. Why are we only looking at them and understanding them now? You know, why is it now that we have two new species when the fossils were dug up so many decades ago? Right. So I had the same question, and it's sort of comes down to scientists are very busy people, and there are a lot of fossils. So this is a huge, huge fossil collection where these were collected in South Africa. Um, And back when these fossils were collected in the 70s, scientists sort of flagged. They said, we don't know quite what this is. This looks a little different. But only in recent years did scientists sort of get the time and resources to go back and and look more closely. Yeah, so many fossils and so little time. That's Mm -hmm. the problem. Mm -hmm. What do we know about how saber-toothed cats went extinct? Right. So that's something scientists are still unraveling. Um, Like a lot of animals that lived during the last glacial period, it probably was a combination of uh, climate warming and a loss of their favorite prey items. So um, as ice retreated, the landscape changed, their food source, which we don't don't yet know what they would have eaten, but maybe they lost their food source. Um, There's also a chance that humans hunted them, and that may have played a role in their ultimate demise. Oh, so we did live at the same time as them, possibly. Well, so that's a that's a great clarifying question. So I should say early humans. So hominins are early ancestors, not quite modern humans. But um, yeah, we do have evidence that uh, our early ancestors overlapped with saber tooths. Absolutely. Do we have any evidence that they also liked to sit on our keyboards? Uh, while we were trying to work. Er, (laughs) Early humans, you know, early keyboards. Right, early keyboards. That's a great one. I was just wondering if saber-tooths could purr. 
I don't know. Mm. I mean, we know that many big cats can't. Right, so. because of that, that. There's a special ossified bone in their throat. I don't know. That's a great question. Sorry, I'm getting off topic now. But Watch this space. Yeah. <laughs> very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Christy, what have you been reading this week that particularly caught your attention? So, Tim, I'm a big mushroom fan. Like, when I go hiking, that's what I'm excitedly taking pictures of, like, every foot of the trail. So I was really excited to see a new story from reporter Alice Klein about using fungi to prevent fires. To prevent fires? Okay, that's not what I would imagine using them for. Don't they normally, when they come into contact with flames, become particularly charred and delicious? Lunchtime is a little too close, Tim. Um, That trait of mushrooms, where they are really hard to overcook, actually might make them even better as flame retardants. Oh, very interesting. So could they be better than some of the ones we've already got? They could, yeah, actually. I mean, many of the flame retardants we have for home or fabrics or, you know, other uses, they're actually quite toxic to human health, um, or at least they're suspected of it. In the past, we used to use asbestos for that, still trying to get all of that out of old buildings. And some of the newer flame retardants are thought to be safer, but there's research that has still linked them to problems with brain development, toxicity in aquatic ecosystems, and especially if they actually catch fire and produce byproducts. Yeah, so I guess that's where the fungi come in. But why actually fungi? I get that it's a life form, so I guess better for the environment. It's a natural product, but is it really fireproof? So it is. Fungi, unlike plants and most animals, have this unique material in their cell structure called chitin. It's a carbohydrate, but it's a very tough, complex one, and it's resistant to burning. It's one of the reasons you can't really overcook a mushroom, unlike a burger or a carrot. Yeah, I I do love a sautéed mushroom, and I love that you can't overcook them. But how do you go from that property to having something that you can fireproof your house with? That's a great question, Tim. So a research team in Melbourne, Australia, has been working on that, and they developed a material that uses the mycelium of edible mushrooms. Mycelium are this root-like structure that mushrooms use to take up nutrients, and they are also rich in chitin. So they grew a bunch of mycelium over a vat of molasses, as you do, And then they heated their mycelium really hot, bashed it to a powder, added another compound to turn the chitin into this more soluble thing called chitazan. Then they squished it all down to sheets about a millimeter thick. Okay, I feel like we need to get to the bit now where they set the mushrooms on fire to see how they do. (laughs) Right. Well, that's right now. And what happened when they set the mushrooms on fire was very, very good. The chitazan, that, you know, additional compound they made... Um, almost immediately formed this charred layer that protected the rest of the sheet of mycelium. And it only caught fire for about one second, and then it went out all on its own. Even better, the only byproducts they measured were water and carbon dioxide. That that sounds pretty good. Um, Except for the part where there are mushrooms in my walls, which normally I would try to avoid. So (laughs) isn't there a problem where they just keep growing, that you've got mushrooms in your walls, and that's not a good thing? Well, we've already killed the fungi with fire. So in that heat treating process, um, the cells are no longer alive. They're just there being that sort of structural component for the fireproofing itself. Okay, that makes sense. So then what would be next before these suddenly start appearing in our homes. Right. I want to order this right now for my imaginary home building project, I guess. (laughs) But the team is definitely hoping to make more of these thin sheets, or they could even do thicker timber-like panels for fireproofing people's homes. And mushrooms don't need light or electricity to grow, so it could be a fairly simple process to scale up. But uh, you do need a lot of space for mushrooms. They're mostly water. You need a lot of mycelium to get any sort of useful material out. And because fungi are a biological material, they're also at risk of contamination. So an industrial process big enough to feed the construction industry will definitely need a bit more tinkering to achieve. Okay, Tim, it is your turn. What has you excited about the entire world of science this week? Well, I've been particularly fascinated by two new space stories. And the first one is about a star that's the first of its kind that we've ever spotted. And it has two faces. Two faces. When you say that, Tim, I can picture a few different ways that could go. Are we talking about Mr. Potato Head? You know, is he swapping out his angry eyes or something else? (laughs) Um, You know, there's Mount Rushmore. Or are we thinking more like Harvey Dent, where his face is literally kind of two things smooshed together? Yeah, it's mostly just a star that talks trash about you behind your back. It's very (laughs) (laughs) two-faced. 
<laughs> no. Well, of those options, it's it's probably most Harvey Dent, but the team behind the discovery, they prefer to compare it to Janus, the two-faced Roman god of doorways and transitions. I guess that's a classical education for you. And so now it's called the Janus Star. And with the star, this is just what's so incredible about it. Its surface is composed of hydrogen on one half, and then the other half is helium. And it's a bit like if you imagine looking at Earth from one angle and it was all entirely land, and suddenly, half a rotation later, it was all ocean. That's mind-boggling, especially when I consider that, you know, stars are these kind of constantly churning, gassy blobs. I don't understand how you would get it to be so you know, kind of perfectly static and mismatched like that. Yeah, it's pretty weird. And we don't know how it gets mismatched like that. But the researchers behind the discovery do have a potential idea. And it involves the star's magnetic field. So basically on the side that's all helium, the magnetic field is weaker. So the gases are churning the way you'd expect with the helium getting to the top just because it's more abundant. But on the other side, the theory goes, the magnetic field is stronger and it's kind of preventing the normal churn. So the hydrogen, which is lighter, floats to the top. But the trouble with this potential idea is that they've not really seen any evidence yet of a very strong magnetic field in the data. Just a little bit of trouble, lack of evidence. Well, if this is the first thing like this we've ever seen, could it also be a mechanism we've just never thought of? Yeah, that's a real possibility. White dwarf stars like this, they do typically go through transitions between hydrogen and helium surfaces fairly regularly. So it may just be we've been very lucky and caught it mid-wardrobe change. That's incredible. Any other weird objects out there in the universe this week? Yeah, so the second particularly cool space story that caught my eye is about the imaginatively named exoplanet PDS-70b. PDS. 70B. What an inspired name for a planet. What's yeah. it like there? Yeah, I wonder if we should just call it PD from now on. <laughs> PD. PD, yeah. So this planet, it's a gas giant seven times the mass of Jupiter. And it's still a relatively young planet that's still forming. But what's particularly exciting about PD is that it seems to have a sibling forming in the very same orbit as it. Okay, so we're going from a star with two faces to an orbit with two planets. When we're talking about an orbit with two planets, though, you're not talking about something orbiting this exoplanet. They're both actually just circling the star in the same line, right? Like little ducklings. Yeah, but very large ducklings in this (laughs) case. Uh, The orbiting bodies have these stable points called Lagrangian points where objects tend to flock because of the way gravity balances out. And the researchers behind the discovery, they specifically went looking at PDS-70b's Lagrangian points with the hope of spotting something interesting. And that's where they found this suspected planet. Though I must say, it's still possible at this stage that it's really just a cloud of gas or the very early stages of a planet. But another thing that's particularly cool about this is that it could be the first time we have ever found evidence of an object forming at a Lagrangian point rather than just kind of being attracted to it from somewhere else. I love this so much. The math said they might find it and then they went looking and they found it. I imagine with exoplanets being so far away, though, it might actually take some time to get more data, correct? Yeah, that's the uh, sad part, is that we're going to have to wait until at least 2026 for the next chance to confirm what they saw. Womp, womp. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. We'll put those stories from Leah Crane and Alex Wilkins in our show notes. Before we go, one last story about a toy that could make life easier in the laboratory. A team of Arizona State University undergraduates tasked with making tools for, quote, frugal science, found a new use for an inexpensive Lego robot. They were using it to purify this three-dimensional DNA structure, and they could do it faster and better than previous non-Lego methods. Yeah, the Lego setup is only a hundred or so dollars cheaper than buying something intended specifically for this process, but it's much easier to modify and prototype, which is pretty neat. And by the way, Christy, whilst I was editing this story this week, I learnt of yet another difference between American and British English, which I've been learning a lot of since moving to New York. So I thought I would tell you this one in case you didn't know. I'm ready. So in the US, you guys say one Lego, two Legos. Mm -hmm. But in the UK, we say one Lego, two Lego. No, what? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it turns out it's only the US. I looked it up. Only the US says Legos. Everywhere else in the world, two Lego. That's like it's a biological creature that i mean because like i I know we'll say like moose you know singular rice okay okay all right well with that in mind thank you all for listening 
As always, our show notes have links to all the fantastic new scientist reporting you heard about on the show today. You can subscribe to our show on whatever app you're listening on. And thanks for your support. Bye for now. Bye. This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk.